Welcome back, everyone, as we dive into another reaction video. We're going back to our friend, the Fat Electrician, today. A number of you have requested that I take a look at his video on old 666, a B-17 bomber from World War II. Uh, given that we are in the middle of a lot of B-17 bomber hype with the release of Masters of the Air, which, if you haven't already checked it out, is fantastic and definitely worth your time. Uh, but let's go ahead and dive into this one. I'll put the link down in the description if you are not familiar with his channel already, and you should be because he's got twice as many subscribers as I do, uh, and hopefully he's going to be hitting a million here before too, too long. So excited for him. I think he does a great job, and we will uh, fill in what we can, where we can, and give a little context, a little more information, look some things up if we need to. And uh, if you have something to add to the conversation, we can all learn together. Use the comment section below and let us know. Let's go ahead and dive in. Two anti-heroes have become best friends and assemble their bombing crew out of a bunch of misfits that don't fit in anywhere else, and they become adamant on doing things their own way. So much so that the U.S. government won't even give them a B-17 to fly. They then proceed to build their own and become the most heavily decorated air crew in U.S. history. Today we're talking about Jay Zemer, Joe Sarnofsky, and their air crew, the Eager Beavers, the most decorated air crew in U.S. history, responsible for completing the most decorated mission in U.S. history, all while flying the most heavily armed bomber of World War II, Lucy, a.k.a. Old 666. This video is brought to you by Warwood Tool, makers of the original American entrenching tool from World War I. And while they're not making entrenching tools anymore, they are making sledgehammers and axes. And they're making nice. them using the same drop hammer forging techniques that they used back in World War I, right out of West Virginia. If you need a tool for the rest of your life, check them out. This video is also brought to you by LAS Concealment. Full disclosure, I originally turned them down as a sponsor because I've done several holster making companies before, and I just think it's disingenuous to have a bunch of sponsors for the same type of product. So I said no. Despite that, they decided to send me a holster anyways for free, and it actually ended up becoming my favorite holster and the only one I've been carrying lately. So moving forward, they are going to be the only holster sponsor of the channel. I need a corporal. You're it until you're dead. Or do I find somebody better? I wonder if I could get LAS to make me a holster for my sledgehammer. Nice. It Anyways, back to the video. Starting off with our pilot and main character, Jay Zemer. Born in 1918, he grew up in Pennsylvania with a pretty wealthy family. For high school, he was sent to a military boarding school in Culver, Indiana. While there is a fresh... So, he mentions that he was born in 1918, which actually makes him kind of old compared to a lot of guys. One of the things that you'll notice if you watch Masters of the Air, at least I did, and maybe it depends on how old you are, but me being a couple of years away from 50 now, um, how young these guys were. I mean, these guys flying these bombers and these these complicated missions and uh, these really risky, dangerous things, they were young. But this guy's born in 1918, so even for him, when the U.S. enters the war, he's 23, 24 years old, makes him an old man compared to a lot of these guys. Despite the school's policy on no students having vehicles, he managed to acquire a willy motor company whip it the direct predecessor of the jeep and he managed to turn this thing into an absolute hot rod better than it ever ran before until the school finally found out that a student had a car which is against the rules so he had a disciplinary meeting with the dean he goes into this meeting with the dean and he's like look i'm in the engineering program i'm taking all the engineering classes i want to go to school to be an engineer i just rebuilt a motor and i'm 14 years old you guys should treat this as extra credit to which and you know he's 14 doing this stuff Sometimes young people, they're really smart and they can do some amazing things. I mean, one of the people most influential in helping develop the television was a high school student. Uh, so don't discount somebody just because of their age. The dean being cool is like, well, take me for a test drive and we'll see. Nice. Takes the dean for a test drive. Yeah, <laughs> the dean has a great time. He ends up giving him extra credit and letting awesome. him keep the car the entire time he's at military boarding school. And this is, it's great that he's pointing this story out from before the war. Cause some people would be like, come on, get to the story, get to the war, get to what happened. But I've said it before and I'll say it again. Understanding people's experiences beforehand matters because it informs why they did things the way they did. Uh, and actually, as someone who's also a pastor, I did a sermon yesterday, I talked about this. I talked about how so often we look at somebody's life right now and we think, wow, they've got such a great life. I wish I had that. But what we don't see is all the stuff that happened before that that shaped them into the person who has that seemingly great life now. The chapters that came before led directly to the chapter they have now in their lives. And so 
you can absolutely see if we're talking about a story with a bomb crew who kind of custom builds their own B-17, stories like this really matter because they inform who this guy is. So his grades were a little lackluster his freshman year because he was busy restoring a car. After that, he aced absolutely everything from sophomore to senior year. He goes on to apply to go to MIT to become a civil engineer. He gets rejected by MIT because his grades were lacking his freshman year. So he drives his whippet that he rebuilt all the way to MIT and he camps outside the of admissions course he office did. for days until they agree to meet him. He then goes in and proceeds to persuade the head of admissions to let him into MIT. So he gets into MIT, goes on to become an engineer. While he's at college he joins the rotc program which is like the pre-officer training program that they have at most colleges well and during world war ii and before world war ii there were a number of paths to becoming an officer and i'm sure there are now too i'm not as familiar with them now rotc was one reserve officer training corps uh you could be picked for ocs officers candidate school once you were already enlisted in the military um and, and going to college was a good way to end up being an officer once the war broke out um but again this is also telling us something about this guy he's relentless he doesn't take no for an answer he is willing to push the envelope a little bit to get what he wants and to be where he wants while he's there he ends up flying a plane and he absolutely loves it it is now his new goal in life to become a fighter pilot so naturally he applies to go off to army air school to become a pilot at which point he is pretty much immediately informed there's a zero percent chance that he will ever get Probably inside the fighter plane because he's way too big at this oh. point in time they only let the smaller guys be the fighter pilots and all the bigger guys had to go work in bombers and jay was a big dude well over six foot uh, so it's not exactly what he wanted but it is the next best thing you're no, not so also not going to be a ball turret gunner that's for sure no big deal he goes in does the paperwork does the physical exam bad news his eyes suck eyes. and his vision yep. is not good enough to become eyesight was a hundred percent a way to get disqualified from any sort of uh skilled position like being a pilot and some guys found ways around this they found ways to cheat the test things like that but it was definitely a big disqualifier pilot. so the entire notion of being a pilot gets shelved for now at least he goes back to college continues going through the rotc program to be an army infantry officer and while this is going on he's constantly researching on ways to make his eyes better and he finally mm. comes across this crazy optometrist named dr bates and he has the Bates method. Basically, this method wanted to treat your eyes like they were muscles. Bates believed that glasses enabled your eyes to be lazy, so he would crush his patient's glasses. And th There's actually a little bit of truth to that because if you've worn glasses like I did most of my adult life, um, thank you LASIK surgery. Oh, what an amazing decision to have that surgery done. Um, if you worn glasses, you, you, re you know that like starting at a young age wearing glasses every time you get a new pair of glasses every couple of years the prescription gets stronger uh now granted it's not muscles that determine that but it's actually the the shape of the lens in your eye but um I think there's still something to that. And then force them to do a bunch of eye straining exercises in hopes of building up better vision, similar to how you would lift weights to get bigger muscles. One of these exercises included staring directly into the sun. Obviously, with hindsight being 2020, this didn't work that well, and it certainly wasn't recommended. But the young Jay Zemer wanted to be a pilot so bad that he was, in fact, willing to go outside every day and attempt to beat the sun in a staring contest. Oh, it's essentially trying to give himself a caveman version of LASIK. Obviously, this does not improve his eyesight. If anything, it makes it better, but it does highlight just how bad this guy wanted to be a pilot. So, World War II kicks off, standards get lowered, and he gets mm. accepted into the bombing program. And from there, he becomes the top of his class pretty much immediately. He is so good at flying bombers that he can actually perform fighter maneuvers wow. inside of a bomber, which is something most pilots would never even imagine. But not only is he naturally talented at it, he also works extremely hard. He could tell every single American, German, and Japanese plane and their capabilities just by their silhouette. He makes an important point there as well. Uh, natural talent and ability and giftedness is one part of the equation, but hard work's a part of it too. Um, you know, you think in sports, uh, someone like LeBron James in basketball. Was he naturally gifted? Absolutely. I mean, as a high school student, everybody was, was already recognizing that. But having talked to people uh, in our family who I know work for the Cavs, they would tell you, first guy to show up to practice, last guy to leave. 
Uh, natural talent's a big part of the equation, but hard work is what gets you to the very top. Uh, repetitiveness, learning, getting that edge, because there's a lot of people who are really talented, but getting that edge by knowing a little more and working a little bit harder can get you to that next level. Friend or foe? No, you idiots. It's a pigeon. So Jay Zemer is hands down the best bomber pilot in training right now. And somewhere along the lines during training, he becomes friends with the best bombardier in training by the name of Joe Sarnofsky. This guy is basically the Larry Bird at putting warheads mm. on foreheads. They hit it off. They become best friends. They have a ton in common. After they graduate from school, they get separate missions and they get separated. So early 1942, Jay Zemer gets assigned to the Fifth Air Force and he's not happy about it because the Fifth Air Force is also referred to as the Forgotten Fifth. The reason they're called that is because they are stationed in Australia and their job right now is to basically run a containment war against Japan, trying mm. to slow them down and contain them to the Pacific. And at this point in time, nobody cares about the Pacific theater. The entire world is watching the European theater as America and Great Britain fight their way through North Africa into Italy to take back France and eventually overthrow Germany. That and that's absolutely true because very early on it was decided by the U.S. because the U.S. is fighting two different wars, really. I mean, they're fighting the war in the Pacific against the Japanese, the British are, and other allies too, but uh, the U.S. is doing much more of the heavy lifting in the US, er, in the Pacific, comparatively speaking, to what they're doing in Europe. Uh, but it was decided early on that it was going to be a Germany first policy. We'll defeat Germany first. We're going to put, not that we're going to ignore the Pacific, but we're going to put most of our resources and our focus on defeating Germany, and then we will worry about finishing off the, off the Japanese. So containment absolutely is what they're trying to do here. But they are starting to push back. Uh, but the real heavy focus to take out Japan comes in 44, 45. That's where the majority of the funding's going. That's where all the attention and glory is. That's the place where young, motivated men like Jay Zemer want to be. But that didn't happen. So Jay shows up to Australia. He is the FNG, the fucking new guy. Nobody trusts him. He has zero street cred. Nobody wants him in their crew. Now, this is partially due to the fact that he's a new guy and that's just how it goes for new guys. Sure. But mainly it's because the Japanese are kind of kicking America's ass right now. It's mid 1942. America just got involved in this war. A lot of their pilots are inexperienced. A lot of their equipment's outdated and everybody's giving all the funding to the European theater. So not only outdated equipment, but you're dealing with equipment that does doesn't even work that well. Things like the torpedoes the U.S. had just were not good at all. So there is a learning curve. Remember, the Japanese have been at war for a couple of years by now. So there is a lot more experience. There is a lot more practical knowledge that has been gained through fighting. Uh, but at the same time, the Japanese haven't had to go toe to toe against an opponent that's equal or even stronger than they are. Uh, so there's going to be a, a moment when the U.S. is going to start to get that edge. And, of course, Midway in mid-1942 is one of those times. Oh, it's not a great time. And you got to remember, since this is 1942, America hasn't come out with the Hellcat or the Corsair yet, meaning that America has no fighter plane capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Japanese Mitsubishi Zero. So even if the bombers did have a fighter escort, they weren't capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Japanese Zeros anyways. So it has never been more dangerous to be inside of a bomber. True. It has never been more important to have everybody in that bomber crew as good as possible to increase everybody's chances of survival. If so facto, nobody wants to risk it on giving a new guy a shot. So... And that's something we're going to see in Masters of the Air as well, which is set in the uh, European theater, is that early on is the most dangerous time for bomber crews. This is before the fighter technology, as he said, is caught up. And so escorts aren't as good. They're not able to go as far. So you see that in the statistics with the bomber crews early on. The, the reason the bloody hundredth in Masters of the Air is called that, they didn't take the most casualties during the war. But they had a huge amount of casualties in a short span of time during the war. And that was that early on, that 1943 time before things kind of the tide starts to turn. So in 44, 45, you start to see the percentage of losses with the bomber crews start to decrease as technology gets better, as they get uh, better fighter coverage, as they start getting an advantage over the Luftwaffe. So it becomes apparent to Jay early on that if he ever wants to get up in the air, he's going to have to do some gangster shit. So he goes over to the bulletin board and on that bulletin board are the missions that are deemed so incredibly dangerous that they are volunteer bases mm. only. And he starts volunteering for all of them, filling in any position position where he's needed the majority of sounds, this reminds me of like playing a, a role-playing game where you go over to a mission board and you're like i'm taking all the missions 
missions would wind up being reconnaissance missions, which is where they're going to take a B-17 flying fortress. Instead of filling it with bombs, they're going to fill it with extra fuel tanks, equip it with cameras, and send it way off into enemy-held territory all by itself to hopefully get some valuable intel. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, a single bomber flying alone in enemy-held territory is extremely dangerous, yep. and nobody is about to let their pilot or co-pilot be the brand new guy fresh out of school, so Jay just has to fill in wherever there's a gap. Over time, he winds up doing everything. He's a tail gunner, a ball gunner, a waste gunner, a navigation guy, a radio guy. He can do everything, and eventually he works himself up enough credit that they let him be co-pilot for a little while. And while he's working as a co-pilot, he figures out something very very important you have to remember he's an engineer he loves taking things apart mm. figuring out how they work why they work trying to make them better and while he's sitting in the co-pilot seat he figures out how the japanese zeros are tackling the b-17s you have to remember this is 1942 the b-17s that they are flying are the b-17 b's they are the first generation of yeah. mass produced b-17s ever and they have one fatal flaw and the japanese figured out how to exploit it you see, the B-17s have a ton of machine guns all over them to defend themselves. They have a tail gunner, a ball gunner, a waste gunner on each side, and a turret on top. The problem front. is none of those can shoot in front of the plane. The only thing the front of the plane has is two 30 caliber flex guns, which you can kind of see right here, which might as well be nothing at all when it comes to shooting down an actual plane. Later generations of the B-17 would end up getting more firepower and turrets on the front to help alleviate this issue. But at this point in time, they didn't have that. So the Japanese Zeros would approach from behind well out of range of the machine guns, pass the B-17 all together, and then go and do a U-turn and approach the B-17 head on and shoot it down. And that's what the Germans did in Europe as well. And you see that again in Masters of the Air. You see how often they come straight at them. And a lot of the injuries and deaths then end up happening for the pilots because they're there in the front. And, and you take out the pilots, you take out the crew. Uh, the most dangerous crew position of all the gunners was actually the waste gunners on the sides. Uh, ball turret, as, as exposed as it seems to be, wasn't all that dangerous, comparatively speaking. Unless the plane was going down and people were bailing out, you didn't have much of a chance then where the B-17 had no way to defend itself. And during his time as a co-pilot, Jay Zemer caught on to this and developed a plan. Fast forward, Jay Zemer on his first mission, he finally got enough street cred and there was finally a mission dangerous enough that they were gonna let him be the pilot. Sure enough, a Japanese Zero shows up, does the exact same thing, passes outside the range of the guns, does a big U-turn, comes back to confront Jay's B-17 head on. As soon as the Zero gets within range, Jay takes his B-17, turns it up on a wingtip, and banks, exposing the belly of the B-17 to the Zero, forcing the Zero to go the exact opposite direction and down, putting it directly in the firing lines of both the belly gunner and the tail gunner. Shoot now, you can do this on a recon mission while you're by yourself. You can't do that on a bombing run. Because in a bombing run, the formation is everything. You've got to keep your formation because sometimes you have dozens or even hundreds of planes that are all in formation. You can't just go banking uh, to get out of the way. So this works in this situation. It wouldn't work in every situation. Shooting down the zero. And that is just one of multiple combat maneuvers that Jay has engineered inside of his head, pushing the B-17 airframe to its absolute limit. Fast forward into the mission, he lands the plane, no problem. The entire crew gets out and swears that they are never getting on a plane with Jay Zemer flying it ever again. And that becomes the new norm for a couple months. Jay went from the new guy that nobody trusted to fly to now he's so good, he's crazy, and we're scared to fly with him. That that said, if you're in that crew and you're doing maneuvers like that, think about what that does to you back in the back where like if you're a waste gunner and you guys are already back to back and suddenly you bank, you're falling into each other, you're worried about falling out of the plane. I, I get it. I really do. That was until a bunch of new reinforcements showed up on the island, and among them was none other than his best friend, Larry Bird. I mean, Joe Sarnofsky. So Jay and Joe start volunteering to go on a bunch of dangerous missions together. Same thing happens every time they fly on a mission. Pretty much everybody else on the plane refuses to ever go on a mission with those two ever again because they're absolutely crazy. But every once in a while, they find somebody just crazy enough to keep flying with them. And over the course of a couple months, they build up an entire air crew that starts volunteering together on every dangerous mission available earning them the nickname the eager beavers and this is a great point too is that crews are often changing a lot you know you read for example about some of these pilots in the hundredth and it wasn't like you had a specific crew that was always the same 10 guys always on the same plane you were on different planes you were kind of 
patch and cruise together. So it wasn't like your whole 10 man crew all finished their 25 missions at the same time, because you might have a guy that gets sick or you might have guys that get wounded or, or get killed. Uh, you might have somebody who's unavailable on a particular day because they're given some other duty. And so these crews changed a lot. Making up the team, we have Bud Thule, apparently the only man smart enough to be a navigator and crazy enough to fly with these guys. And then, of course, we have Jay Zemer as the pilot, Joe Sarnowski as the bombardier. And from there, it just gets completely out of hand because after that, we have the radio expert, William Bond, a.k.a. Willie. He is one of the most experienced bomber crew members in the entire U.S. military at this point that's been on countless missions, one of which his B-17 landed to refuel when his crew was ambushed by 500 Japanese soldiers. They took the machine guns out of their B-17 and proceeded to defend themselves in a firefight for 10 hours until the Australians wow. showed back up. And during that 10 hours, Willie had 14 confirmed kills, four of which were in close quarters combat, two with his Colt 45 1911, and two with his knife. Jay Zemer said he didn't plan on getting in any knife fights at 30,000 feet, but if he did, he had Willie. Next, we have camera expert and waste gunner George Kendrick. Typically on a B-17, you're supposed to have one waste gunner on either side of the plane, but Kendrick preferred to man both sides completely by himself. When Jay Zemer asked him if he wanted to find another waste gunner for the other side, Kendrick said, and I quote, these are my guns, and I'm going to shoot all of them. I don't need to be bumping asses with another guy while I do it. Which is And like like I said earlier, it's absolutely true. These waste gunners, you could see it in that video. They're back to back. They're bumping into each other. It definitely, I get why he would feel that way. The most American shit I've ever heard in my <laughs> entire life. Next, we have Johnny Abel, a 19-year-old farm kid that's so mechanically gifted that he is deemed more valuable as a mechanic on the ground than he is a member of a bombing crew. Despite that, he wants to be a pilot, so... Jay is teaching him how to become a pilot, but in the meantime, he's the topside turret gunner. Next, we have the tail gunner, and he is the biggest, fastest, strongest man in the entire 5th Air Force, Herbert Pugh, a.k.a. Pudge. There was a couple other stragglers that came and went, went on a couple missions here, a couple missions there, but this was it. This was a core group of men that became best friends and went on the most dangerous mm. bombing runs and reconnaissance missions that the war had to offer. Because of this, they very quickly built up an incredible reputation and became too valuable to lose, at which point leadership doesn't let them go out on the dangerous missions anymore, and they send them out on a regular bombing run with like 10 other B-17s, and if that wasn't bad enough, they're going to make Jay and his men be the first bomber in line, which if you don't know, is the safest bomber in the entire run, because as soon as their bombs hit the ground, that's what alerts the enemy that they're even there. So when they go through, there's no enemies manning the anti-aircraft guns, so they're done and gone by the time there's any enemies returning fire. It I'm not sure. Maybe it was different in the Pacific. I don't think dropping your bombs is how they knew. I mean, these guys were very often flying hundreds of miles to their targets sp several hours, and radar would have picked them up, and fighters definitely would have been coming after them. Now, maybe in the Pacific, because you're flying over the ocean, that's not as much the case, but I'm not sure how I feel about that. It's that second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth plane that faces the real danger, and that's just not okay with Jay and his men. So and the same thing in this case, these these bombers are all so tightly formed in their formations that they're really pretty much dropping their bombs at the same time. I mean, it's not like you have one guy come in, drop his bombs, two minutes later, the next one, three minutes after that, the next one, so that there would be time to be manning your anti-aircraft. This is kind of a boom, boom, boom situation. So they go out on the mission just like they're ordered to, and they are the first ones to drop their bombs just like they're ordered to. They make a clean getaway. They get out to open ocean, at which point Jay tells his men, get ready for a fight because he does a U-turn, goes back in, flies over the enemy compound at a thousand feet while his men from the ball turret, the waste guns, and the tail guns open fire on the enemy's anti-aircraft positions on the ground. He's flying a bomber on a strafing run. That's basically what they're doing. This is hardcore literally becoming a ground attack plane like they're an antique C-130. They were able to knock out all of the enemy spotlights in most of their anti-aircraft positions, and every single B-17 on that mission made it back home. So Jay, the Eager Beavers, and all the other B-17s on this mission make it back to base completely okay, at which point Jay is treated like a hero by his commanding officers. No, I'm just kidding. You see, the commanding officers can't give themselves a bunch of medals if their men are defying orders but doing the right thing because it makes them look bad. So naturally, Jay is somehow the bad guy here. So 
I'm torn on this. I get that this is heroic stuff and, and it's it, it's cool that he's doing but I mean there is such a thing as a chain of command in the military and you especially with these bombers their doctrine and their formation and you know kind of sticking together is such an important part of this that I get why the higher ups are hearing about this and they're like yeah no I don't think so you can't be pulling this kind of stuff off. He and the eager beavers are all confined to quarters pending court martial. Hmm. The only reason that Jay and his entire crew weren't kicked out of the military right then and there was because there was a journalist in Australia with the fifth air force that heard the story from one of the hmm. other B 17 crews. And they reported on it, writing a story that would end up getting read by a congressman that wanted it investigated. And he demanded and ordered that chain of command to give Jay Joe and all of his men on that air crew a silver star. So at that point, Jay and all of his men get a silver star. Leadership just kind of has to drop the issue, but also fuck these guys. We're not going to give them easy missions anymore. We're only going to give them the hardest missions we have. And if they die, they die. Mm. We don't really care anymore because they made us look bad, which is exactly what Jay and his men wanted all along. So it all works out. All right, fast forward. Next big dangerous mission officially known as flight of the geishas. Naval code breakers have deciphered enough messages to figure out that in the city of Rabul, there's a hotel and the penthouse of that hotel is being used as an exclusive officer's club where they are being entertained by a bunch of geishas and getting hammered. And among those officers is rumored to be none other than Admiral Yamamoto, the leader of the entire Japanese Navy. Their mission is to fly in with a single B-17 under the cover of night, bomb that hotel, take out all the high-ranking officers, and make a clean mm. getaway. And this obviously is not when they get Yamamoto. They end up getting him later on another mission where they crack the code and they figure out where he's going to be flying from one place to another and they intercept the bomber that he's on board and they shoot it down. And my understanding is that the plane he was on that crashed in the jungle is still there and it takes a while to get there, but you can actually go see the plane on the ground in the middle of the jungle still. So Jay and the crew get pulled in. They get briefed on the mission. No big deal. Everybody's going to go off to bed. They got a big day tomorrow. Everybody except for Joe Sarnofsky. He stays up all night long studying the map Doesn't of seem the city wise. of Rabul. Nobody knows why. They just think he's overcautious. I'd be worried about that, though, that staying up all night would... If you've ever stayed up all night before, you know that you're, you're kind of edgy. You, if you go real long without sleep, you start hallucinating. I don't know if I want my bomber pilot staying up all night the night before a mission. They go to bed. Joe stays up. Fast forward the next day. They take off on their mission. Jay flies them all the way there, gets them real close to the hotel, at which point Jay can actually send the controls of the plane over to Joe Sarnofsky in the bomb bay so Joe can control the plane and really line up the shot that he wants. And that's exactly what happened. And if you've watched Masters of the Air, you see that. They actually communicate. And he, he tells the bomber deer, okay, we're getting ready to do the bombing run. You have the aircraft. And then once that's done, once the bomber deer drops his bombs, then he transfers control of the aircraft back to the pilot wants with this bomb. So Jay sends the controls over to Joe. Joe opens the bomb doors and veers way off course, miles and miles off course, like 10 miles off course. Joe steers this plane, essentially blind, driving the plane just from what he can see outside of the bomb bay. And then before anybody even knows what's happening, Joe just says bombs away, drops the bombs on a seemingly random location and sends the controls back over to Jay. Everyone is completely confused. Nobody knows what's going on. The bombs make impact and there is a humongous explosion, way bigger than this 500 pound bomb could have ever done on its own. Joe had just hit a major ammunition depot for the entire Japanese Navy and his single bomb set off a chain reaction blowing up the entire facility. Come to find out Joe Sarnofsky didn't feel right about killing innocent geisha girls. Hmm. And he decided that he was going to find a target that was just as, if not more valuable than the officer's club. I know how this is going to come across in saying this stuff and kind of taking exception to this guy's modus operandi here with this stuff. But, and, and I get, why you would feel leery about attacking a civilian target like that. But you can't have people disobeying orders like this repeatedly. So I get why he gets grounded. I get why he wasn't getting supported and had to basically build his own B-17 and go on missions. If I was his superior officer, I'd probably take exception to the way he's acting too. That's just how I feel. 
and blow that up instead. So they make it back to base, tell leadership everything that happened, and leadership is absolutely furious that they decided to do their own thing instead. Yep, as they, they should be. They interrogate the entire crew, but nobody is ratting on Joe Sarnofsky. Yeah, something did you I did not say that, man. Why you always I did. What'd you say? I told him I'm banging the way. <laughs> So as a punishment, they're ordered to do the mission again, and this time do it right. But that is essentially a death sentence because now they know that the Americans are bombing the city and they're gonna be on high alert. So they're just gonna do it anyways. And I think leadership was actually trying to get them killed, but it's not really gonna work out that way. So crew goes to bed early. Joe Sarnofsky stays up all night again, studying the map of the city of Rabul. And yet again, the same exact thing happens. Jay gets them all the way there, completely undetected, sends the controls of the plane over to Joe. Joe opens the bomb bay, veers way off course, miles and miles off course, bombs a seemingly random location, and there is an even bigger explosion than the day before. It is an enormous explosion. Jay had just taken out a major fuel depot, again, for the entire Japanese Navy. They they make their way back to base, at which point they are effectively grounded and leadership will never give them a B-17 to fly again because they were totally understand to follow that. orders. And they are given absolutely no credit for single-handedly bombing major fuel and ammunition depots. In this Listen, it's good they did that, but you can't just do your own thing. You can't. I'm sorry. I, I know this whole video is about how tough these guys were and how amazing they were, but I'm just... I'm not feeling it right now. I just I just don't like the idea of these guys just doing their own thing when they're given orders. City of Rabul. All right, so leadership's being a bunch of dicks. They're not going to let Jay and the Eager Beavers fly any more of the good B-17s, which sucks because at that point, there's really nothing that they can do unless they plan on building their own airplane, which which is exactly what they do. So Jay and the Beavers go out to the Boneyard and the Boneyard is not just where planes go to die. They go there to be cannibalized for any good parts they may have left to keep all the other planes still running. And what they come across is what used to be a B-17. It has been stripped of every usable Jeez. part and is covered in bullet holes and there is no way that this thing is gonna fly. The only identifying characteristics of this plane at all was the faded word Lucy up on the front and the tail number 2666, which would later bring about its nickname, old 666. So now they have a plane, they just need to fix it, a seemingly impossible task, but they have Jay Zemer, the engineer, and Johnny Abel, the 19-year-old mechanical prodigy, that set forward restoring this plane, while everybody else on the crew goes out and steals all the parts they need to do it. I mean, strategically transfers equipment to an alternate location. Some of the equipment that the Eager Beavers managed to acquire included four new Cyclone engines, radio equipment, camera equipment, and 19 50 caliber machine guns. Right. Dang. And my understanding as well, is, in having read about this story a long time ago, and I, I could be remembering this wrong, but I think I seem to remember that some of the other crews that were at that same base would submit fake requisitions for new and replacement parts they needed for their planes in order to help supply these guys. Right off the bat, we have a problem because right around the time that the Beavers start finding all of this amazing equipment, a bunch of other air crews seemingly have lost a bunch of their oh, amazing equipment. Yeah. So a bunch of them are going to go back and try to steal it off of old 666, oh, at which point the only logical solution is for the entire crew to start living on old 666 while they restore it all day and all night and spread the word that the 50 caliber machine guns are loaded. And if that doesn't work, you get to fight Willy about it. At this point, leadership has completely lost control of the situation. Everybody's calling Jay Zemer and the Eager Beavers pirates, renegades. Everybody's looking at leadership to stop them. At which point leadership is kind of like, fuck, I think they might be talking to me too and I don't want to fight Willy, so we're all just going to look the other way. Like we talked about earlier in the video, there's not much firepower at the front of a B-17, so they take a 50 caliber machine gun, mount it right on the nose cone, and they line it up with the rivet line going down the center of the cab, and they rig it up so that there's a button inside the cockpit for Jay Zemer to hit to be able to fire the 50 caliber wow. machine gun. So all he has to do is aim the rivet line at the enemy and fire. He calls it his schnozzler gun. Then the other two 30 caliber guns on the front of the B-17 are replaced with 50 cals. The navigator compartment usually had one 30 caliber machine gun. Now it's gonna have dual 50s. Then the seat for the radio guy who typically never even had a gun. Oh well, we're gonna cut a hole in the plane and give him two 50 caliber machine guns as well. Then we get to George Kendrick's area, the waste guns. Typically there's one 50 caliber on each side double it now we're getting dual 50s on each side and because i feel like all this added weight is going to be a problem in flying this plane 
that's not enough we're also going to cut another hole in the bottom of the plane and give him dual 50s there as well that way when jay banks up in front of the zero not only can the ball turret gunner hit the zero kendrick is also going to be able to hit the zero as well then in case any of the guns malfunction they have three extra 50 caliber machine guns strapped down on the inside of the plane old 666 now has more than double the firepower of any other b-17 in the pacific theater and after shedding over 2,000 pounds it is also the fastest but all that firepower isn't going to be worth a whole how did they shed 2,000 pounds if they loaded it with all these machine guns unless they're not going to carry bombs i'm curious about that so they did not carry bombs they only flew they only flew a couple missions with this plane from what i've read uh, and uh, they only did photo reconnaissance missions. They didn't do any bombing runs with the other guys. So that makes sense. They didn't have to carry bombs. They also stripped out a lot of unnecessary equipment. The engines they had were lighter, and they took out all of the like the ammunition feeding equipment for the machine guns uh, and some other structural things they did to reduce the weight. A lot if they don't know how to use it. So Jay and Johnny continue working on the plane while everybody else is sent out to go train and become experts on the M250 caliber machine gun. The Beavers get to the point where every single member of the crew can assemble and disassemble the M2 Browning in under a minute while blindfolded. Joe and Jay also make it a rule that every gunner inside of their aircraft has to link their own ammunition belts and they're going to change up how they do ammunition. You see at this point a B-17 50 caliber machine gun had an ammo link that went armor piercing round, armor piercing round incendiary round incendiary round tracer if you don't know a tracer is mm. like the little one that looks like a laser beam coming out from star wars they do that so that you can tell where your fire is going and so that your friends can see where your fire is going they start linking their ammunition so it's armor piercing round tracer round and they do this for psychological warfare because when you're shooting every other round as a tracer round out of a machine gun it is going to look like old 666 is something out of star wars <laughs> straight up shooting laser beams at the enemy not real effective though in terms so of damage. So they finish up the plane and they start volunteering for every single dangerous mission that they can find. They volunteer for so many missions so often that they never actually got an opportunity to finish the nose art on the plane like you see all the other bombers have in the movies and in the old pictures and that's why the plane never got a cooler nickname other than its tail number old 666. Now most of these missions just like before are recon. It is Jay the Eager Beavers. He makes it sound like they did a ton of missions but from what I just read, they only did three missions with this plane. It only flew five times after they put it all together, and two of those were to test it out to see if it could fly. An old 666 going up into enemy territory completely by themselves, and every single time they come into enemy zeros, they light them up. The new machine guns are incredible, and old 666 is the aerial equivalent of George Foreman on his second title run. It's big, he's fat, he's got terrible gas mileage, but if you're going to stand in the pocket and trade with them, you're probably going to get put in the ground. Allegedly, with the combination of increased speed, increased firepower, Jay's piloting tactics, and the entire crew's newfound machine gun proficiency, they were shooting down so many enemies that it became unbelievable. So the crew came back and people started doubting them. So they're like, fine, we're just going to rig up the cameras to turn on every time we start firing the machine guns that way we film us shooting down the enemy fire and that actually became a pretty standard thing in the u.s air forces that they would have cameras on all their planes and they could go back and watch and and they could learn from it it could be training but it could also be verification for the missions because there was a lot of exaggerating that was going on again talking about the guys in masters of the air they had one mission where they came back and between all the air crews they claimed to have shot down almost 300 fighters and the actual number was like 40. So a little bit more background here and looking this up. Uh, apparently it wasn't given uh, this name Lucy until they had actually flown a couple missions with it already. Uh, and so they commissioned a 65th artist to paint the name Lucy in script on the port side of the nose. Uh, between and underneath the small forward window and enlarged the gun window on that side. The woman, the name came from a young woman named Lucille who Zemer had dated. So it didn't already have the name Lucy when they acquired it. That was actually a name given to it after they'd already flown some missions with it. And it was a name that Zemer actually chose. Um, so Lucky 666 is a strictly modern invention of the authors for that title. It was never a name or handle that was given to the aircraft at the time. Uh, that's kind of a 
retroactive history that we're applying to it. They didn't call it 666 or use that number in any significant way uh, during these missions. So, um, so they flew a couple of camera missions before it became Lucy, uh, and then the, they have their famous mission that comes up after that. So um, I'm just kind of reading through this here. And then it returns to the U.S. in March of 44. So yeah, they only flew a couple of missions with it, really not very many at all. Which is the most world star shit I've ever heard in my entire life. They were literally kicking so much ass that to get people to believe them, they had to prematurely invent the GoPro 70 years ahead of time. The beatings continue for a little while. Old 666, the Eager Beavers, and Jay Zemer build up this enormous reputation, and eventually leadership would approach Jay with the most dangerous mission he'd ever heard of. All right, so here's a mission. The Marines are going to make a 40,000 man amphibious landing in Bougainville, yeah. but before they do that, they wanted to get aerial footage over the coastline because they wanted to find out where all the reefs were so the Marine Corps didn't get caught up on the reefs with their amphibious landing vehicles. The problem with that is the only way to get enough high definition in that footage to be able to see reefs that are underwater is to use a trimetragon camera setup, which is three cameras where they merge all the footage together. And the only way to actually film this and make it work is to fly in a perfectly straight line under perfect weather conditions and they can't move the plane at all even mm. a single degree of tilt would ruin the entire thing and in order to film this coastline they're gonna have to do that for 22 minutes straight in enemy territory and that enemy territory may or may not have enemy fighters and anti-aircraft guns on the coast and if there is anti-aircraft guns on the coast it's pretty much game over because again they have to fly can't, in a perfectly straight evade. line for 22 minutes straight in broad fucking daylight the worst gunner on the planet has enough time to get dialed in and shoot them down. And that's assuming they even make it to the coastline because Bougainville is 600 miles into enemy held territory. Because of this, the leadership only approached Jay with this mission because they were just hoping that he would pilot it. They never in their wildest dreams imagined that his entire crew would volunteer to go on this mission because it had such a low chance of survival. Despite that, after being briefed on the entire thing, Jay rushes over to the barracks where the beavers are, briefs them on the entire thing, and he's like, look, I'm calculating there's like a 10% chance that we survive this. I don't expect any of you to go with me. I don't blame you if you don't in any way, but... If you do want to volunteer, there's nobody I would rather have up there with me than you guys. At which point, every single one of the eager beavers stands up, and they're going with him. Whose car are we going to take? Later on when retelling this story, one of the beavers is quoted as saying, We thought so much of Captain Zemer and his abilities that we didn't give a damn where we went just so long as he wanted to go there. Anything okay by him was okay by hmm. us. Jay then runs back over to the colonel that had just briefed him as he is pinning the volunteer slip onto the board to collect volunteers for this mission. Jay grabs a paper, crumples it up, says that him and the eager beavers are going to take the mission on one condition. He does it how he wants to do it and they have no further input. He will get the mission done. At which point the colonel agrees and it's settled. Right. The only thing to do now is to get prepared for the mission and wait for army meteorologists to tell them that they're going to have a day clear enough to actually pull this off. Now, I will give credit to the higher ups. This is kind of what you have to do in this situation, right? Is uh, you've got a guy who's going to do his own thing, who's not going to play by the rules. He really can't be part of a bomber formation flying traditional missions. But these are the kinds of missions you can use him for and he would actually be very good for, provided he actually does the mission he's assigned to and so it's worth a chance i guess it's monsoon season a couple of weeks go by and then finally they get word from the army weather guys hey tomorrow's the day the weather's gonna break you can get this mission done so they all get prepped and they take off first thing in the morning when it's still dark out for this dangerous mission so they take off they're making their way over to bougainville they get like halfway there it's still dark out everything's going great and leadership radios over to jay and they're like hey by the way um extra credit it would be pretty cool if you could pop up to the top of the island and film Buka Passage as well. We don't need trimetragon footage, just normal footage would work. You can do it while it's still kind of dusk out. If you could get that done too, that'd be great. At which point Jay is like, no, I don't, I don't need extra credit during this extremely dangerous mission. That wasn't what we agreed to. I'm not doing that. Then they're like, well, 
too bad it's an order to which he just like hangs up on the guy he doesn't really care he's gonna do what he wants anyways because that's been his mo the entire time okay fast forward they get all the way to bougainville it's still too dark out for them to start filming with this trimetric on footage so jay asks the crew and he's like look uh, i can do a u-turn we can fly 15 minutes out over the open ocean do another u-turn come back that'll be half an hour that should be bright enough by then or we could fly like 45 minutes north film buka passage and then come back and do this after and the crew is like i don't whatever i don't care so they go they film buka passage then they come back it is now broad daylight so they start filming their trimetragon footage they get five minutes into the 22 minute run and they come up on a japanese airstrip and on that airstrip is over 20 japanese zeros and he can see men running out to the planes to come get him. Now, Jay doesn't realize it at this point, but these weren't just normal Japanese Zeros. This was one of the best fighter squadrons that Japan had that was specifically brought in to go take out Admiral Halsey. And in this squadron, they had two aces with a combined over 30 confirmed air-to-air -air kills. And even if this wasn't a specialized badass fighter squadron, 20 on one is still completely undoable. They'd gone up against five, six, seven Zeros. Mm -hmm. They'd never gone up against 10, let alone 20 plus. It's at this moment that Jay has to make a decision because he knows that by the time all the Japanese zeros get up in the sky, get in their formation and actually attack him, he's going to have just enough time to finish this camera run. However, then he's going to have to fight his right. way out, which is probably a death sentence. Or he could cut and run right now, and he's almost guaranteed to be able to get away with a 20 minute head start. He's taken a second to weigh his options and really think about it, and he's just about ready to cut and run, and he looks down at the water and he can just see all these reefs just right below the water, and he just envisions 40,000 Marines uh. and their amphibious landing vehicles hung up on these reefs getting cut down by enemy defenses and machine gun fire and he decides that he's going to risk it to try to save these guys Jeez. and for the next 17 minutes the crew gets ready for a fight as jay keeps the plane completely straight and level in broad daylight as all the zeros get up in the air to come get them. Fast forward 17 minutes later, two dozen Japanese Zeros have caught up to them and they are trailing just behind 666 out of machine gun range. Right as George Kendrick comes over the radio and says, give me 30 more seconds, three Zeros pass along the outside, do their U-turn to begin their attack run no. against 666. Then George Kendrick radios again that he has the film done. At this point, it's too late for Jade to do his normal evasive maneuver where he plays chicken with one of the Zeros. So he just lines up the nose of the plane and his schnozzler gun with the lead Zero <laughs> shooting it down joe sarnofsky down below inside the nose cone manning those guns manages to shoot down one of the other zeros and the third and final zero was able to riddle the cockpit with 20 millimeter cannon fire this fatally wounds both jay zemer and joe sarnofsky takes out all the navigation equipment for the plane as well as the entire oxygen system so one thing we have to keep in mind here is that the one advantage they do have is that they're not a typical b-17 so if these Japanese pilots have faced B-17s before. They understand where the danger zones are for fire from the B-17. They know what to expect. So they, there's an element of surprise here in that they don't know what to expect in this case. Jay Zemer is now slowly bleeding out inside of this cockpit with no way of knowing where he has this plane headed other than instinct and a compass that he's holding in his hand. And he has about 30 seconds of oxygen left before the entire crew passes out from hypoxia. And the remaining Japanese Zeros all now know that this is not a normal B-17. Their typical tactics aren't going to work right. and they just begin swarming every direction they can, firing from all angles. Jay immediately puts the plane into a nosedive, desperately trying to get below 10,000 feet so him and his men can breathe with the oxygen system down. He drops 15,000 feet in just under 30 seconds. Wow. That is over three miles in 30 seconds this plane Jeez. drops before Jay pulls it back up. And he estimates- The G-forces, these guys must have been hitting the ceiling in the back. So they're at 8,000 feet. He doesn't actually know because the altimeter is broken. And the only way he can tell the altitude that they're at is because he's such a good pilot, he can look at the pressure gauge for the engine manifolds and be able to tell. At this point, the entire situation devolves into an all out chaotic dogfight. Jay, while still bleeding out, is pulling off combat maneuvers inside of a B-17 that most pilots would never even attempt. And his crew instinctively knows how he pilots so that they are able to pick off these Japanese zeros one mm. by one. Your average dogfight at this point in time lasted for less than a minute and this dogfight would drag out for over 45 minutes and the entire time Jay Zemer is losing more and more blood and more and more control of the plane. He said he, fatal, he was fatally wounded but Jay Zemer lived until 2007 so didn't he say that the pilot and the co-pilot were both fatally wounded in this mission? 
I don't know. I'm confused a little bit. Because at some point, both rudders would become damaged, and he would no longer be able to actually turn the plane using the rudders. But he's such an incredible pilot that he begins individually throttling all four motors, throttling one side up and the other side down, turning the plane that way. Hmm. Throughout the course of this firefight, the Eager Beavers shoot down and completely destroy five Japanese Zeros, critically damage and send back a bunch of other ones. And by the end of this firefight, there's five or six left, fully functional and coming to get them, and they are almost out of ammunition. And right as it looks like this is gonna be the end, the Zeros peel off and do a U-turn as they have to go back because they've ran out of fuel. Uh, At this point, Jason- Yeah, people- don't realize how limited the ammunition was on these fighters. They they couldn't go up there and just and do that for like 10, 20 minutes. You had like a number of seconds of ammunition until you ran out. Zemer passes out and the co-pilot is finally allowed to take over the aircraft, something that Jay Zemer refused to let him do in the heat of the fight. For the entire flight back, Jay is coming in and out of consciousness, and the last thing he remembers is them landing and the ground crew rushing in as he hears the medics say, get the pilot last, he's already dead. He would wake up in the hospital days later to find out that he had lost over half the blood in his wow. entire body but the intel that they had gathered was going to be used to launch Operation Cartwheel, a highly successful Allied offensive that military planners credited that success to the intel that Jay Zemer and the Eager Beavers had So gathered. it wasn't fatally wounded. Because of this, wounded. both Jay Zemer and Joe Sarnowski were to receive the Medal of Honor. Unfortunately, Joe would have to receive his posthumously. Yeah. According to the accounts of the rest of the crew, he was struck by a 20 millimeter round during the first engagement. Despite that, he still managed to man the machine guns at the front of the B-17, shooting down an additional two Japanese Zeros before succumbing to his wounds. As for the rest of the Eager Beavers, four of them sustained injuries, but they all survived, and all of them were awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for this mission, making this the most decorated air crew in U.S. military history. Yeah, I mean, if your pilots both get the Medal of Honor and everybody else on the crew gets a Distinguished Service Cross, that's about as good as it gets. Uh, that's impressive. So so the one the co-pilot was fatally wounded, the pilot was severely wounded, but he did live until 2007. And making this the most decorated mission in U.S. history. According to the official Japanese reports, this story is highly exaggerated because according to them, they only sent up seven zeros to intercept old 666 and none of them were shot down. However, when you take into account the verifiable fact that old 666 was hit with five 20 millimeter cannon rounds and sustained over 187 bullet holes and the crew depleted all of their ammunition, literally thousands of pounds of 50 caliber rounds, it kinda sounds like the Japanese official reports are fucking lying so that they don't look bad. In conclusion, now you know the story of Jay Zemer and the Eager Beavers, a bunch of young men that blurred the lines between bravery and insanity that ultimately were deemed so reckless that the government wouldn't give them a B-17 to fly, so they built their own <laughs> and became the most decorated air crew in American history. Thank you for watching. So yeah, if, if some of you guys I know probably know way more about this story than I do, so I would love to hear your thoughts, add to the conversation. Let's learn together. Let's talk a little bit more about this. Uh, and we'll kind of go from there. Check out his channel. I'll put the link down in the description. I've done a reaction to a couple of his other videos in the past. So if you want to check those out, I'll put up some links here at the end as well. Thanks for watching.